I believe it's gearing up. We are now live. This is the eighth and final session of the Leo Strauss seminars that Michael Millerman has been conducting for the past eight weeks. And of all of the courses I've played a role in, this is unique for me in a way, because this is the first one that I have not actively participated in. So I'm personally very excited and just genuinely curious to learn what are the main interests and observations and lessons learned or ideas generated by the group over the past eight weeks. So what we do in this eighth and final session for all of the seminar series that we do is we just make it more of a public format. So it's the same vibe, the same style of discussion, really, that has been going on in, in the group over the past eight weeks. But now we turn this to a more public facing style, a more public facing format. And uh, Michael and I have invited all of the participants in the course, everyone who's been working hard on, on the text of Leo Strauss over the past eight weeks to prepare themselves a short talk that represents some big idea that has been of great interest to them throughout the course. And we just get, we want to give everyone a, an opportunity to develop a focused, thoughtful presentation that might be of interest to, to a more public audience, because everyone here has been working very hard, reading a lot of Leo Strauss thinking and discussing and, you know, very intensive uh, analysis and discussion over the past eight weeks uh, led by Michael. So the, chances are in these seminars, typically lessons emerge or ideas develop that are genuinely valuable and, 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 and will be genuinely of interest to a more public audience of other people working on Leo Strauss or just generally interested in Leo Strauss. So that's the idea. And with, without too much ado, uh, Michael, if Michael would like to say any introductory remarks, um, maybe about, about the seminar or just in, since this is our, our eighth and final meeting, uh, Michael, Certainly, if, you, if you'd like to say anything before we kick off, you're more than welcome to. If you want to hold fire and save your comments to the end, that's also perfectly fine. But that's pretty much the game plan for today. And for everyone out there listening or watching, thank you for coming out. I think it's, it'll, this should be really quite interesting uh, series of talks. We have a bunch of prepared talks, and they're going to be relatively short because we do have a lot of people. But uh, everyone should have an opportunity to, to go fairly deep on, on their, their main ideas that have emerged from this course. So Michael, if you have anything you'd like to say before we get into the talks, you're more than welcome to, but otherwise um, we'll, we'll get on with it. The only thing I'd like to say for anybody who's watching for the first time is that if you want to see what the group has been reading, you can go to otherlife.co slash Strauss. We looked at um, living issues in German post-war philosophy by Strauss, German nihilism, persecution in the art of writing. What is political philosophy? The essay in the book by the same name. Uh, his restatement on Xenophon's hiero from On Tyranny and a few chapters from Natural Right and History, just to give you the context of what um, the participants will be drawing on in their presentations and in their remarks. Of course, people may have been reading outside of the syllabus as well, uh, in which case you'll hear that, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thank you for that uh, mention, Michael. And that, that's, that's a very good point. So, all right, without further ado, en enough from me. I'm, I'm honestly super excited to hear what you all have been brewing over the past eight weeks. So I'm just going to go in the order that abstracts have been submitted. So that means first up is Lou. Lou has prepared a short talk on wisdom and moderation. So please take it away, Lou. Thanks very much, Justin. Uh, thanks, Michael. I want to just start with a very quick uh, unsolicited. I was not paid. I was not asked to say this. An unsolicited recommendation that this was an excellent course um, all around the community. Uh, Michael, the instructor, I just, I can't recommend highly enough if you're interested in, in philosophy or pol political philosophy in any degree. Um, and then specifically to Strauss, I'm somebody who had never read Strauss, but I had, I'm somewhat uh, into philosophy and it's been incredibly rewarding. So, you know, uh, I wish I could temper this with some sort of negative comments or something, but I, I really just had a, a really positive time here. So, I'm so my, glad my to hear talk, it. thank you for that, Lou. My talk is on uh, philosophy and moderation, wisdom and moderation. Um, and I just want to give you a few guiding questions that I had um, that led me to write my talk. And then I'll just read my talk. I'm going to really try and keep it within the time bounds. If I go over, please just let me know. Um, so, 
one of my uh, main interests in philosophy is Heidegger. And it's very interesting that uh, in one of the texts you read, What is Political Philosophy by Strauss, he references kind of obliquely, although it's somewhat obvious, Heidegger um, in the context of moderation. He, he, he indicates that in, Heidegger, in Heidegger's rectorship um, in 1933, when he made a sort of political, Heidegger even says a political stupidity, um, that was perhaps because of a kind of uh, uh, disconnect with moderation that what Strauss might say is Heidegger's historicist background led to. And so that, that's kind of one interesting thing like, wow, um, that's an interesting critique of Heidegger I haven't heard before that he was, that moderation was his issue. Um, and so a few other questions, can we separate prudence, um, or let's say moderation and insight? Um, is moderation just a regulation of our bodily appetites, of our animal nature, or does it apply to also intellectual endeavors? Um, can we formalize moderation? Can we make an app for it so that we can have a good assessment of what uh, moderation is in a kind of technical sense? Um, can we have moderation without philosophy? And can we have philosophy without moderation? Uh, these are all kind of guiding questions. And just to see how deep I learned through researching this talk, this theme goes, um, I came across this controversy between Straussians, students and followers of Strauss, uh, uh, Thomas Pangle and Henry Jaffa, where Thomas Pangle is like writing these very intense letters to Henry Jaffa saying, you are being immoderate <laughs> and using this, the, this put down of being immoderate. So it's amazing that among Straussians, it's not just a philosophical theme, it's actually a, a sort of almost like a code of, of moderation. That, that you can live by. So now I'll read my talk. Um, I'd like to begin with a quote from Goethe um, that we'll come back to at the end uh, of my reflections. It's the closing sentence of the first forward by Husserl in his Logical Investigations. Yeah, logical Investigations. And he quotes Goethe saying, there is nothing to which one is more severe than the errors that one has just abandoned. So, can kind of think of uh, devout Christians losing their faith and becoming the most staunch critics of Christianity, devout communists becoming conservatives, becoming the most staunch criticism of communism, that kind of dynamic. So just just a, an opening thought. So philosophy and moderation, the importance of moderation. These phrases evoke a sense of boredom almost instantly. If I were to entitle my talk, The Value of Moderation, you would probably Think this is a trite Sunday school lesson more than a discussion of the history of philosophy. But insofar as Strauss is concerned, moderation and our understanding of it is of the utmost importance. Indeed, the relationship between moderation and philosophy is at the very heart of many of Strauss's arguments concerning the difference between the ancients and the moderns. Before we dive into Strauss per se, let's tap into our commonplaces, our platitudes about moderation, our everyday sense of it. We repeat old adages like everything in moderation or nothing in excess, but do we really think about the correct application of such theories to our practice? For the most part, what is moderate seems self-evident. Indeed, we can tell what is moderate from what is immoderate as easily as we can distinguish a casual drinker from an alcoholic. But can we formalize this knowledge? We might consider this the positivist approach to moderation. We looked at the data. We looked at the data and we can determine that at 3.6 drinks per day, one becomes an alcoholic. But that of course depends on your body mass index, the strength of the alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed, some person might raise their hand and say, 3.6 drinks sounds like an arbitrary number and point out that there are many different attitudes as to what counts as moderate versus immoderate drinking. We might christen this the historicist view of moderate drinking. Namely, the idea that what is moderate drinking depends on the culture and the historical time in which you live. Strauss would not be satisfied with either of these attempts at understanding moderation. Both the positivist and the historicist approaches miss something crucial. So how then can we begin to understand moderation as Strauss might? Perhaps philosophy can tell us what moderation is and how to practice it properly. No. Michael pointed me to a fascinating passage in a transcript of Strauss's 1957 course on Plato's Republic. 
Strauss there says to a student, philosophy cannot be moderate. This is impossible. For example, if you call a thinker a moderate thinker, you have an absurdity. You can have a moderate drinker, but you cannot have a moderate thinker. And to uh, foreshadow the destination of, of uh, this talk, let us say that uh, on this note that Strauss tells us in On Tyranny that Machiavelli and modern political philosophy in general has uncoupled philosophy and moderation. So it is possible to, to have one without the other in Strauss's, in Strauss's eyes. So philosophy as a love of wisdom and moderation are not linked in a necessary way. But this doesn't mean that the relation between the two is mere happenstance or accident or unimportant. Far from it. Moderation is essential if philosophy is to succeed. But this is a strange circumstance. Philosophy needs to understand and practice moderation. And yet moderation as such is outside philosophy's ken, so to speak, as evidenced by Machiavelli's separation of the two. We might provisionally define moderation as a knowledge of where and when something is appropriate and in what degree. The important insight here vis-a-vis -vis Strauss is that we need to use this kind of moderation with respect to philosophy itself. The unbridled excessive search for truth and questioning that is philosophy cannot be made fully public without harmful political consequences, according to Strauss. Indeed, look at the case of Socrates condemned to death. Although, I, I'm uncertain on this point a bit. It's a question I still want to think about because uh, Socrates is Strauss's paradigmatic example of moderation. So can we really consider his excessive philosophizing immoderate? That's, that's a question I'll have to think more about. So to come to my point, for Strauss, the moderns like Machiavelli and Hobbes abandon the classical ideal of excellence. They lower the standard of what is virtuous. They also do not allow moderation to be a factor in the presentation of philosophies to the public. They profane the mystery, so to speak, and do not moderate their speech to what is appropriate for the polis, for the political climate. And this has far reaching consequences. For example, um, uh, Strauss mentions in On Tyranny that the ancients knew that evil could never be eradicated from the world. And so they had moderate expectations of what is possible politically. Whereas the more outlandish utopias of the moderns grow from a kind of modern abandonment of moderation. But this raises a question with which I will close. I'll leave you with this. Isn't Machiavelli and Hobbes, et cetera, known for turning their gaze away from the standards of excellence that guided the ancients and towards a standard of looking at man as we really find him, as he really is? On this reading, we could perhaps say that the ancients are the ones who are too excessive in their devotion to excellence. And the moderns are the ones who bring a more moderate view of man into discussion. This seems directly contrary to Strauss's reading, but things are not so simple. I haven't worked out the logic at work here fully, but I'll say this. My opening quote from Goethe read, there is nothing to which one is more severe than the errors that one has just abandoned. And on Strauss's reading, I, I kind of see that in the moderns that in abandoning the standard of excellence, they are almost too vicious in criticizing it. And, and, and what that means is that um, in abandoning the standards of excellence, the moderns have in fact abandoned the virtue of moderation itself. They abandon trying to be excellent in moderation in some way. Uh, this, is a mis this is kind of an obscure thing to say, but to put it another way, um, there's a kind of arete or excellence of moderation that the, ex that the ancients had, and that perhaps Strauss can teach us this. Uh, Strauss, Strauss can teach us this using the ancients. Uh, a final clue is uh, in something that Strauss, that really struck me, that Strauss repeats often. Uh, you can find it in the preface to Liberalism, Ancient and Modern. He says, it is safer to understand the low and the light of the high than the high and the light of the low. In doing the latter, one necessarily distorts the high, whereas in doing the former, one does not deprive the low of the freedom to reveal itself fully as what it is. So that, that, that's my sort of working guide. So excellence 
in moderation is in some way an autonomous. It's not fully controlled by philosophy. It's a kind of meta skill that regulates even philosophy itself. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Lou. Very thoughtful remarks. Thank Very you. fascinating. Very nice. I made some notes. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back and get to talk about all this. Michael, if you want to interject. No, it's a great set of reflections on a theme that is somehow all important to Strauss, very central. And uh, you brought out just the right things to think about um, in relation to it, I would say. Yeah, it was absolutely interesting and very well articulated. Stephen, would you like to go next? You're just next sure. up on the list. Stephen has a talk on Strauss's critique of Nietzsche and Heidegger and, and the question of the return to Plato. Please, Stephen. Feel free, take it away. Yeah, I wanted to uh, thank Justin for hosting this course and, and Michael for teaching it. This was an absolutely outstanding course. I think it was um, one of the best courses I've ever taken and I really, really enjoyed it and would recommend it in the future. Uh, the title of my presentation is Alt Strauss, an experiment in alternative history and thought. And it's pretty short. Once there was a young man, his name was not Leo Strauss. In his twenties, he read Nietzsche and believed liter literally every word that he understood. He studied Heidegger and became convinced that Heidegger alone had made it possible for the first time in many centuries to see the roots of philosophy in ancient Greece and know that they are healthy. Heidegger had given a phenomenological analysis of the early Greek philosophers and Plato, but had also concluded that Plato had made a fatal mistake by confusing being itself with the eidos of the good, which could only be one among the many beings, and by turning his attention to the latter, thereby occluding being. With this mistake, Plato had set Western philosophy on a false course, ending with Nietzsche, from which it could begin anew only now after 23 centuries. The young man thought that the first beginning, which Heidegger deemed mistaken, could be re-engaged and renewed. His first thought was to prioritize the political for the sake of moderation and seek to articulate natural right and ultimately all the parts that reveal the whole. He would remain in the mode of political philosophy while avoiding the interpretation of the ideas that both Nietzsche and Heidegger had condemned. He decided to reread The Republic, but when he reached book seven, he stopped and began to rethink the relation of the political to being. What if the ideas are not at all otherworldly, as Nietzsche had claimed? What if they are rather the invariants of our world to include the human world of the political? Nietzsche had described Christianity as Platonism for the masses, but perhaps the correspondence Nietzsche perceived ran the other way. What if Nietzsche, the son of a Lutheran minister, had mistakenly read Plato through the lens of Christianity? What if Heidegger, the former Catholic seminarian who wrote his habilitation thesis on Duns Scotus, had projected late scholasticism onto his reading of Plato? Perhaps in their critiques of Plato, their real targets were closer to hand. Both had formed a commitment to atheism and saw Plato's metaphysical exploration as a threatening precursor to the Christianity they had rejected. Surely one could read Plato on his own terms without a prior commitment to conclusions that must be avoided. One could see seek the first things, not assuming them to be found within the ancestral or the gods or one of the monotheistic religious traditions but also not assuming them to be exclusively material. One can read books six and seven of the Republic, not as Plato's final word on being, but merely as steps in its pursuit. Nothing in that pursuit impedes one from seeking the first things as natures, 
not however stopping at beings, even as ideas, but passing on to being itself. How do we come to know natures? We can start where Aristotle did, with the evidence of our senses, refined and reflected upon with dialectic and logic. The power of senses is extended through the use of instruments employed in controlled experiments. We can follow Francis Bacon in this extension of the, ex of the senses and logic, even if we do not follow him in his rejection of formal and final causes. A key principle sought in this approach to science is cosmos, the order exhibited by the universe. A theory expressed mathematically, such as those of modern physics, does more than describe matter in motion. It describes invariance of form. We encounter form at the lowest levels, such as the table of particles in the standard model of quantum field theory, with its arrangement of quarks, leptons, and bosons. The pattern extends upward with the periodic table of elements in chemistry. One thing we never encounter in nature is matter without form, nor could we. The notion of undifferentiated matter as conceived by Descartes, Hobbes, and Newton is a myth, one that we could do well to abandon. As we move upward through molecular biology and genetics, we uncover successively higher levels of form, bringing cosmos more into view. Science, so understood, does not direct our knowledge downward in a reduction to matter, but upward, providing the foundations for human cognitive, social, and ethical life. In the pursuit of knowledge, a platonic approach without truncation is more not less viable than it was in the ancient world. Its chief impediments are intellectual biases inherited not from any mistake of Plato's, but from the turn of early modernity. And that's it, thank you. Fascinating, fascinating. I'm, I'm very impressed by the first few talks. Very thoughtful and very well prepared. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bite my tongue and not make all the comments I would love to make just to, just to, to move swiftly. And uh, we'll start, we'll have plenty of time to circle back to some of the interesting uh, tantalizing themes that have already been kicked up. So awesome, Stephen. And the next person that submitted an abstract was Samuel Barnes. Samuel is going to give a talk about the idea of the philosopher as a criminal. I'm very intrigued. Samuel, please take it away. Thanks. I, I trust you can hear me. Um, yeah, obviously, like everyone said, um, yeah, it's been a really great course. Uh, Michael, thanks for everything. Um, Strauss definitely isn't, you know, someone I would immediately have thought would be so relevant to all the stuff I'm working on. So that's really great. Um, so, yeah, as uh, Justin was saying, um, my talk's generally about the philosopher as criminal, but um, the main uh, thrust of what I want to get at is that um, he's a criminal by virtue of his um, assertion of philosophical supremacy, which I think is a theme that follows from, you know, from Plato all the way down to Strauss. Supremacy, regularly overused and misapplied in our current time, often by those who play with words as if they are merely assertions with no double meaning. I endeavor here to use the word in a deserving sense. To be supreme is to be categorically better than another. It is with this meaning that I, as a wannabe philosopher, assert the truth of philosophical supremacy. This supremacy comes with a long lineage from Plato to Leo Strauss. This sees things in the meta sense, transgressing and transvaluing is what the philosopher has done and will always do, just as long as there is that spark which makes them mutants. And I read now from um, Strauss on tyranny, the restatement. Um, philosophy as such is nothing but genuine awareness of the problems, i.e. of the fundamental and comprehensive problems. The aberration that is the philosopher is trans everything, a perverse combination of logic and poetry, which makes these creatures able to bear the knowledge that reality and experience with it could go pop at any moment. What would it mean to call yourself a philosopher? 
Most of those who have the credentials are agents of what Strauss calls government-sponsored views. These agents are the commissioners of assassination by an indirect low-risk method, the yearning pages of the legacy media. If only it was so simple for those with any conviction left. A philosopher can't see whether you're red team or blue team because they've called the concept of color into question. Neoconservative? Strauss has more in common with Michel Foucault than George Bush. Strauss's great majority are blind to the maxim, compulsion does not produce conviction. And that's from uh, Persecution the Art of Writing. The philosopher dances around the noble lie of spectacle, the popular teaching in the foreground of political philosophy. The philosopher not only writes and speaks exoterically, but also lives their lives between the lines. This is the deepest kind of criminality to polite society. Polite society isn't bothered by enemies it can see. It wishes to sublimate and co such convert co covert ele elements into the group of over enemies. Therefore, the philosopher must be a covert guide in order to play their normative part as the intellectual source of the city. This makes the philosopher a supervillain when he is reproached by the culture of our age. Although we know that reality is far more complex, the philosopher in a trans-historical sense remains a noble villain. The philosopher knows of nothing but encrypted channels as a matter of necessity. If you're of the inclination, you don't simply feel or know it, you just are. I return again to Strauss's covert wisdom on uh, persecution and the art of writing. The works of the great writers of the past are very beautiful, even from without, and yet they're visible beauty is sheer ugliness compared with the beauty of those hidden treasures which disclose themselves only after very long, never easy, but always pleasant work. This always difficult but pleasant work is, I believe, what the philosophers had in mind when they recommended education. Education, they felt, is the only answer to the always pressing question, to the political question par excellence, of how to reconcile order, which is not oppression, with freedom, which is not license. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Once again, very thoughtful and obviously well-prepared talk. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, already starting to notice some, some possible connections between some of the talks. So that's always, that's always very enriching and, and intriguing to observe. So again, I'll bite my tongue and, and we'll circle back. So next up on the list, we would love to hear from Sam. Sam Klinger is going to give a talk about Leo Strauss's relationship to Spinoza. Please, Sam, take it away. So early on in this course, I realized that Leo Strauss had uh, his whole philosophical project could be seen as a giant refutation to Baruch Spinoza. Before I uh, enrolled in this course, I knew Strauss was interested in Spinoza. He did a lot of his early writings back in Weimar, Germany on Spinoza and uh, wrote a book on, on the uh, philosopher. So there are a few things that both Spinoza and Strauss have in common that I think we should get out of the way. Both of them, both Strauss and Spinoza are Jewish philosophers. Uh, they were they they had a very strong Jewish education, and although Strauss, in his writings on Spinoza, rejects the sub rejects uh, Spinoza's Judaism, given the fact that he was exiled, and excommunicated from his con from his uh, Amsterdam congregation for refuting uh, for refuting the Old Testament. I, I think both, both men are, are very influenced by Jewish philosophy, especially Jewish medieval philosophy. And uh, that's more of a similarity than a difference, even if they come to radically different conclusions. Uh, diff the difference, in addition to uh, Jewish medieval philosophy, both Strauss and Spinoza are influenced by Islamic rationalism. Uh, now, the difference is uh, Spinoza is an Enlightenment rationalist and a su early supporter of what we, would, what we would now call liberal democracy. Uh, Strauss is 
very critical of the Enlightenment. He's very critical of rationalism, and he's very critical of liberal democracy. Although after World War II, he does reluctantly embrace uh, the liberal democracy of the victors. Uh, so uh, Strauss's main critique of liberal democracy and of, ration, of rationalism is that, uh, is that Strauss uh, sees rational, reason as an authority and impeding on the personal freedoms of the philosopher. Uh, it is, it's, uh, Strauss is no different than religion in that regard. And that's especially apparent in Spinoza's philosophy, where he, which, I mean, in the ethics, uh, Spinoza equates, first of all, equates nature with God. God is everything. God is everything within nature. And, uh, and argues that this God can be understood not by revelation, but by reason. And this would deeply, deeply trouble uh, Leo Strauss, who is, a, who is a, a man who sees that, sees religion as incompatible with philosophy. Religion is based off revelation. It's based off faith. You have to accept these tenets because otherwise they don't mean anything. Break it, abandoning that understanding of religion is abandoning law itself. Because religion, at least in its original understanding, was equivalent with the law. Spinoza, um, in this way, Spinoza is a lawbreaker. Uh, Spinoza, on the other hand, sees religion and philosophy as wholly compatible. Uh, I would, I would argue with, I would take the side of Spinoza, but before I do that, I should, I should explore this critique uh, Strauss makes of Spinoza in his essay, Reason and Revelation. In Reason and Revelation, Spinoza, uh, Strauss critiques Spinoza's ethics as an appeal to, to authority. Uh, so Spinoza's ethics is written in the form of uh, Euclidean geometry. So at the beginning of every chapter, and especially at the beginning of the book, he sets a long list of uh, axioms that uh, serve as the basis of his, of his uh, book. Now, Spinoza never really justifies these axioms indep independent of, those ra of, of them. Instead, instead, he often resorts to circular reasoning and uh, using other axioms of his to justify other axioms. There's no, there's no proof from outside of the text, so to speak. Uh, however, I, however, I believe Strauss is wrong to say that this is no different than religion. As, Spino as Spinoza, while he under while Spinoza understand while Spinoza claims that you could uh, discover God through the use of uh, the use of reason and reason alone, he uh, he does not uh, Spino Spinoza does not uh, does not take what God the does not take the attributes and description of what God is as a given. What he gives is a vague descriptor, everything or nature. What is within everything, what is within nature is for us to discover. And that is the topic of his ethic, of his ethics. So, but this doesn't eliminate the, pro the uh, political problem that uh, religion no longer serves a law, no longer serves an authority. It's, it's, it just is, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. And, uh, and Strauss sees that as incredibly dangerous because there's no understanding of uh, what is good or what is evil in politics. Uh, therefore, in his, therefore, Strauss in his lectures on uh, Spinoza's politics, 
sees lumps in uh, Spinoza with Machiavelli and Thomas Hobbes as both uh, enlight Enlightenment moderns whose understanding of politics is completely amoral, not immoral, but amoral, completely devoid of uh, morality. Uh, but not necessarily against morality. So I'm gonna quote a passage from Spinoza's political treatise. Uh, the best way to organize a state is essentially, is easily discovered by considering the purpose of civil order, which is nothing other than peace and security of life. Therefore, the best state is one where men live together in harmony and where laws are preserved unbroken. For it is certain that rebellious wars and contempt for or violation of these laws are to be attributed not so much to the wickedness of the subjects as to the faulty organization of the state. He goes on to say, furthermore, men's natural passions are everywhere the same. So if wickedness is more prevalent and wrongdoing more frequent in one commonwealth than another, one can be sure that this is because the former has that not done enough to promote harmony and has not framed its laws with sufficient forethought, and thus it has not attained the full right of a commonwealth. And here, public morality is completely dependent on the state. There's nothing outside of the state, no rules, no laws outside of the state that could, uh, that uh, citizens can be held to. Th this standard, I mean, this standard, Strauss would, lay, would argue is, is dangerous because, it, because, it's depend, because the dependency of morality upon the state uh, could justify atrocities, could justify atrocities complete, uh, completed by a state. Strauss would argue that if you don't, if, uh, the state is responsible for the morality of the people, then the people aren't, then uh, how can you hold the Germans accountable for the Holocaust, as so many do? I mean, the Strauss would be absurd for Spinoza to uh, hold the Germans accountable for killing his people in the 1930s. Uh, so I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna, this, and this, I'm gonna leave a uh, discussion with these thoughts. Uh, what, what can a, uh, how can a uh, secular religion, how can a, how can a secular religion uh, avoid these kind of traps, avoid these kind of, uh, avoid being, avoid being depend, completely dependent on their state for their morality without being, uh, without their without a strict code of rules without a strict code of conduct this is a uh, this is a question that many that liberal christians liberal muslims liberal jews form judaism a uh, tradition in which i was raised has to reckon with uh, personally i've noticed reform judaism kind of degenerate in the past decade into a uh, very into this very social justice uh this very social justice uh network of synagogues at least in chicago where i am so having a more firm grounding and not just following the uh not not following whatever morality is popular uh in the city mm -hmm. is necessary in order to uh preserve the free preserve religious freedom and philosophical freedom thank you all right fascinating question i i, I very much like that you ended up ended it on a uh, a challenging question in, indeed so that will give us much to to chew on and thank you very thank you very much sam for your thoughtful remarks and moving right along just to be swift we have also um on the list is aiden 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 would like to share his exoteric Straussian take. Uh, he, he will withhold his, his esoteric Straussian take. Aiden, please. 
go ahead and uh, take it away. Aiden, are you with us? I guess I should uh, check that before I invite people to speak. <laughs> and now that I'm looking at the list, it looks like maybe Aiden is not here. Correct me if I'm wrong, Aiden, but uh, all right, fair enough. Maybe maybe he had some kind of emergency or who knows what. Uh, apologies, I should have I should have cleared that before I uh, went down the list. That's all right. Maybe Aiden will come late. Um, his his abstract that he submitted is quite interesting, so I hope he I hope he shows up. But if not, that's perfectly fine. Uh, moving on down the list, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. I'm sure everyone here has interesting ideas, comments, questions on the on the talks that have been given, but maybe also some impromptu uh, final thoughts that they would like to share about their their takeaways on the course and and on Leo Strauss more generally. But next up, uh, Paul Mills, would you like to say a brief few words? I, I think you said you weren't quite sure if you wanted to, so no pressure. But I th I think we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to say a few words. Yeah, sure. Please. Um. So I did not have the time to write a more formal statement, um, but I guess I'd like to start off by saying, A, I really enjoyed this course. Um, I was not familiar at all with um, Strauss's work before coming here. Um, it was a very enjoyable experience, both reading and then discussing with everybody. Um, the sort of question topic that I wanted to talk about was sort of a tension that I've been feeling both that I noticed when reading Strauss and then also one that I feel just more generally um, in the US. And that is sort of the tension that exists between how Strauss calls for moderation um, in political speech. He sort of is aware of the fact that the philosophical speech and philosophical ideas can be destructive to society and can be, you know, they can destroy things because they question authority and they question all sorts of things. And therefore, the philosopher should be moderate um, in his speech and in any sort of you know statements he may make to the more general public. Um, but at the same point in time, in uh, the origin of the idea of natural right, we see Strauss define um, a. I guess the fact that Strauss definitely, I think, sees philosophical thought as sort of the best way to live. It is sort of the best life and is the best thing you can be and the best thing you can do. And the only way to get to a place where you could have philosophical discussion is by originally destroying the order that came before it. So he just he writes in the origin and idea of natural right, the first things and the right way cannot become questionable or the object of a quest or philosophy cannot emerge or nature cannot be discovered if authority as such is not doubted or as long as at least any general statement of any being whatsoever is accepted on trust. The emergence of the idea of natural right presupposes, therefore, the doubt of authority. And so when I was reading that, I felt this sort of tension there because on the one hand, Strauss says, you don't want to destroy the society you live in because you need the society you live in to be stable to have philosophical discussion. But on the other hand, you only ever got to philosophical discussion in the first place by basically destroying the last society that came before it. And I feel the same sort of tension play out, I think today politically in the US because on the one hand, I feel very appreciative of the American experiment. I sort of, I do definitely believe in a lot of the ideals of the country, but then we also see a sort of need for political change and the calls for what should be changed are varying from like minor things to total upheaval and change of the system. And there's sort of just this tension in this question of, you know, Strauss himself, clearly you only get the philosophers by destroying what came beforehand. Like you had to break with that original tradition to get here. And now you're in this place where I think of the US as, you know, relatively very peaceful, relatively very stable society comparatively historically. And in that sense, a very good thing to have. But I also see very clearly that there are problems that need to be dealt with. And this tension there of like, how do you improve society, even if necessitates breaking society? And how do you sort of accept that like, there can be better? And how do you make those decisions? And how do you make those changes? Uh, as just a tension that I felt both observing the world um, personally and then also throughout this course um, in his writings. And that was just sort of the tension that I wanted to bring up. So thank you for the chance to talk. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul, for preparing some thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I noticed already some interesting overlap now across multiple talks. I've been making some notes here. Moderation seems to be a very interesting question to a lot of people. And 
it's been very interesting for me. I guess we'll now kind of, by the way, folks, open it up to discussion. If anyone wants to uh, share a, a, a somewhat more developed thought, even if you didn't submit an abstract, you're, you know, please feel free. Everyone here is uh, more than capable of uh, contributing at any length that you feel uh, you'd like to. So please don't be shy. And uh, that is the uh, that is now the end of the group of people who prepared abstracts. But now I'd love to open up the discussion and uh, circle back to any of the themes that people might have been interested in in the discussions that have already been kicked off, uh, or if people want to raise somewhat new questions. Uh, Michael, at, at any at any point, if you if you'd like to uh, jump in, please. You know, you're you're steering the ship with me, so uh, feel free to feel free to navigate however you'd like to. And uh, anyone out there chomping at the bit to um, maybe ask a question about a previous talk, maybe address something that they came up, maybe add some kind of uh, statement or comment to something that they heard, or perhaps make a new make a new statement or observation about Leo Strauss as we you know as we kind of wrap up this seminar series. I will be looking at uh, digital hand raises if you would like to do that, but uh, we don't have a huge group, so you can feel free to jump in if you would like. Sure, I'll, I'd like to say something. Please. Um, just ab about uh, gr great talks, everyone, and this issue of moderation. I really found that thinking in terms of moderation kind of really dispelled whatever lingering, let's say, vulgar Straussianism that I had, the sense of like, oh, Strauss is a neocon, we should noble, we should have a noble lie to <laughs> delude the public so that we can do what we really want or whatever. Because when you couch it in terms of moderation, it really seems like a much more practical, concrete and universal issue where it's obvious that there's something like decorum and propriety in what you say, where you say it and how you say it. And uh, I just thought that um, uh, th that's a great way if you're speaking with somebody who has these kind of preconceptions about Strauss that couching in terms of moderation seems very helpful. Mm. Mm. Let me just add one thing there about the importance of propriety for Strauss. I've mentioned this in another context, but if you compare the opening, his opening remarks in natural right in history with his opening remarks in on tyranny, for example, you'll see how front and center for Strauss, the question of what's appropriate really is and of acting with propriety. It's something he not only taught, but also put into practice. And there's no way that we can fully appreciate his teaching, I think, without taking into account the role of, as he puts it in on, on tyranny, Socratic rhetoric, or as he also puts it, using the distinction between the citizen philosopher that's the philosopher who still bears a civic responsibility and conducts himself with civic decency and the stranger philosopher, the philosopher who does not belong to the city, does not share the same responsibilities. The stranger is a figure in some of Plato's dialogues, for example, the laws. And Strauss makes quite a lot, I would say, both um, explicitly and implicitly of the distinction between the citizen philosopher and the stranger philosopher in his in the parts of On Tyranny that we didn't read together and discuss together, namely his commentary proper on the Hiero. So all of that is to really just convey that propriety does stand in a big way at the center of Strauss's conduct and at the center of his thought about how to combine the best way of life for the individual with the best way of life for the city. So this is particularly fun for me because since I'm not a you know, particularly erudite Strauss scholar, other than, you know, the, the, the few Strauss books I read maybe in grad school. Uh, this is fun because I can genuinely kind of play the dumb interlocutor and uh, ask some challenging questions or follow up questions on some of the, some of the presentations out of, out of genuine interest to have some of my own questions answered. I, I'm, I notice that moderation is, is of interest to, to many people here. So I want to start with that and it, kind of going back in particular to Lou's initial presentation when Lou was talking about this idea that th this idea that philosophy on some level can't be mo can't be moderate to be philosophy philosophy must must not submit to moderation but then it sounded like Lou was trying to suggest that there is a Straussian understanding in which philosophy can be its immoderate self but also by comprehending the nature of of 
modesty and the requirements of modesty that it can somehow square the circle. But I have to admit, I didn't, I didn't quite grok personally, what, what really is that solution? Maybe, maybe if Lou, you could speak to that a little bit more, or if someone else wants to take a stab at it, because, and I come from a somewhat different school of thought myself, you know, my, my philosophical role models tend to be rather immodest, right? I think of, I think of people like Diogenes and the great kind of revolutionary vitalistic approaches to, to philosophy has always been what, what has been in my mind, the, the, the image of, of true philosophy. So I would love to learn a little bit more about how one can be a true philosopher and also abide by what Michael was just calling propriety or modesty. I, I'm, I'm really quite interested to learn this a little bit more concretely. Lou, would, would you like to speak to that or did yeah. someone else want to take a stab? Yeah, that's exactly the crux. And the archetype of the philosopher that you just mentioned is exactly the one that I feel like, um, you know, made me fall in love with philosophy is like the brave individual within it. Like, I would almost say that, um, like philosophy for me is like an addiction to truth. Like you, you can't help but be obsessed with it and be searching yeah. it in a very excessive, like crazy manner. And so with that is like the archetype that honestly really appeals to me. And you should, you should pay attention, I think, um, to like what, what forms of, of, you know, individuals like appeal to you just naturally. So if that appeals to me, I was like, oh, I should really read Strauss carefully because he's presenting a kind of very different archetype of what a philosopher should be. And I've never really, can, I've like moderation and propriety, they're just, those just seem like guardrails. Those just seem like ways to, uh, compromise to philosophy back. That just yeah. seems like, uh, you know, it, it, and that, but then you're all almost getting into kind of enlightenment stuff where it's like, Oh, all of this, all of this useless tradition has just been baggage that doesn't, that doesn't help us get towards truth. And so, it's, it's very tough. I'm, I hope other people have to say, obviously, Michael probably has something to say, but I guess my thought about it now is that, um, that, that brash immodesty, um, it, it does have its, it does have its place. Um, and I would say that, and Strauss recognized that's why I said philosophy can never be uh, immoderate. And, I, and I'm th he's thinking there like internally, like internal to philosophy itself in the, in the activity of it, you cannot compromise. But as sort of when you come into relation now with the polis, you do have to think about compromise perhaps. And does that, you know, are you giving up your principle then of being like a fearless truth seeker? Right. Um, that that's, I kind of had a thought there that would push this further, but I, I kind of lost it. Um, I, I guess, I guess, oh, this was it. That noticing this is something he kind of alludes to that the ancients, they had insight, having insight into what decorum is, into what is appropriate, into what belongs here and in what degree, that is a, that is a kind of theoretical insight in itself. And so that, that is important to acknowledge. And if you just cut that away, as you kind of suggested the moderns have done Machiavelli, then you're actually losing a bit of theory that is that could be very important to actually understanding how the political works. And so it's not just a practical concern. It's actually, some, it's a, it's actually a, a deep kind of almost um, pre-philosophical insight into the nature of the, of the social world that you lose touch with, I say, when, uh, I'd say when you just say, oh, th throw propriety to the, to the dogs, whatever. Okay. That's the best I have. <laughs> okay. I think, I think I see where you're going with that. Anyone want to add to that or say something uh, different on this question? I have just a few points to, uh, just a few points to add. The last one that Lou made is very important that moderation may have a, if you don't understand the truth about man, if you don't understand the political need for moderation. So in that sense, moderation is a very important theoretical teaching and you have less of the truth if you don't understand the proper place of moderation in politics. Another thing, and I mentioned this in 
some of the lectures, Heinrich Meyer, a Straussian scholar, really brought it out in comments that he's made, which is that before Strauss, nobody elevated the concept of political philosophy to a place of such centrality as Strauss did. So we're talking about the philosopher and we're right to do that. But we should understand, I think, moderation together with this phrase political philosophy. Somehow, maybe the wisdom side of wisdom and moderation belongs to philosophy and the moderation side belongs to the political dimension. So he's not a pure philosopher and he doesn't write about pure philosophers. You've all seen that, that the heart of his presentation is the problem of political philosophy. That's why we have essays like what is political philosophy and books like the political philosophy of Hobbes or um, the final co collection of volumes studies in platonic political philosophy. So when you really add political philosophy as the, as the, as the beating heart of what it is to have self-knowledge as a philosopher, then you have to take moderation into account as a necessity in a way that the non-political philosophers may avoid having to do. And one other thing, just as a, as a reminder and for anybody listening in, Strauss always thought, um, he always reflected deeply on the play called The Clouds by Aristophanes, where at first Socrates is, let's say, a pure philosopher, not a political philosopher. And uh, the result of his not taking the needs of the city into consideration is that an angry father burns down his think tank. And so when you, when you get that, when you get the whole lesson of that play, you see how Aristophanes may have been teaching Socrates something about the need for moderation as a philosopher. Can you continue to live the best life if you don't take into account the potential risk that when you undermine the prevailing paternal pieties and all of that, you may have angry old men coming to, um, with their pitchforks to set your school on fire or okay with their whatever you know to chase you out and to set your school on fire so yeah some things to consider in relation to uh, that issue i like i like that i get your first point that basically the, the the requirement to understand modesty and what it calls for is itself a philosophical challenge and if one wants to seek the truth fully and uncompromisingly one must also go to the to the limit of understanding what modesty requires and calls for, because that is a kind of social, it's like a social scientific puzzle and a kind of philosophical puzzle. So if you're seeking the truth, you have to figure out that puzzle as well. Anyone else want to comment on this, on this theme or this topic in any way? You could take it in a, diff a different direction if you want to, or would anyone like to articulate a, a, a new line of thought, a new argument, a new observation, or would anyone want to circle back to anything they heard in one of the presentations? Walter's yeah, got sure, to Walter. Up. There we go. Okay. Uh, sorry, I had my digital hand up for a while. I just, I don't think oh, sorry. It. Somehow I missed um, that. Go ahead, please. No, no problem. Um, um, to, to add to this two, two brief comments that um, may or may not be helpful, but at the end of Paul's talk, uh, or I guess the beginning, closer to the beginning, he, he mentioned this idea of order and chaos being, being a sort of split. And I was thinking about how that, that functions for political philosophy. That's how we think about politics. We're either in a state of stability or not. Um, but, but for the philosopher, at least in the way that Strauss is talking about it, that, that dichotomy doesn't really work. Uh, I don't know any philosopher who's particularly interested in chaos. I know there are a lot of sort of uh, post Heideggerian French philosophy is uh, accused of that, um, but if you actually read their works, they're not. I mean, they're not writing nonsense, or else why would they be writing? At, at some level, it doesn't quite make sense. So I don't. I think this idea of pursuing chaos, um, well, maybe somebody like George Bataille or whatever. I don't know. I have friends who are in Bataille. I've never read him. I can't. I can't say that about him. But you know, there is this notion of desiring a, a level of anarchic approach. But uh, the antithesis to. I don't know what the antithesis would be. Um, but it seemed for, for a political philosopher, for somebody of a Straussian, but it wouldn't be chaos. It would be something like nature or at least a properly, um, a properly, it's hard not to get like wrapped up in the, the different levels of, of a properly ordered philosopher, somebody and a philosopher who has his, his thoughts straight. Maybe Michael can, can fix this for me in a moment, but it would be the opposite would be something like order in nature um, where you have a kind of political, political order that's in fun, that's, that's already, that's already there. Um, and that brings me to my second thought that I had while listening to Lou's talk. Um, I think it was Lou, uh, anyhow, somebody here, which, which is related, which is the importance of constitutionalism. Um, 
Um, no, no, no. I'm sorry. This was this was a reflection on on Michael bringing up the stranger and the um, the the citizen philosopher and the notion that that uh, and again, this is only a, ha a half thought here, but the the importance of defining who is the stranger and who is who is the citizen. And I think in our liberal democracy, uh, or the way we think about it, we have a kind of we don't really have borders on our thoughts or we have a more or less open society and therefore there is no stranger uh, to a certain degree. I realize we're politically there. People are always being ostracized or at least called out um, as, as to who belongs. Um, and something that I think Strauss has, has made more important for me is the importance of constitutionalism to really define who is the stranger and who is the citizen so that there actually can be a um, there can there can be philosophy that uh, is both moderate and immoderate and can you can't really even play within those rules without a constitutionalism like if that makes sense and maybe you can I don't I might I'll, I'll soften that statement anyhow those are my those are my two reflections okay interesting thank you thank you for that interesting comment about constitutionalism I mean it does you do make me wonder if you know I think one could make the argument that the and I'm, I guess I don't want to beat a dead horse I'm kind of going back to what I was saying before but one might want to make the argument, perhaps contra Strauss, perhaps not, but that 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 philosophy does require one to be a stranger to the polis in, in some in some degree. Maybe that's not correct. It's, it seems to be my hunch, uh, and that to the to the degree that one is a citizen, perhaps perhaps being a citizen is just intrinsically kind of structurally uh, impinging on on the philosophical obligation to some degree, perhaps, perhaps not. It's a question. Um, but the question about constitutionalism is interesting. I wouldn't have necessarily thought of that word myself in, in this context, but I, I think I see where you're going with that. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that or answer, answer some of the, some of the questions implied in Walter's comments. Oh, I was Let just going to say, Oh, sorry. Oh, go sorry. Ahead, <laughs> Strauss makes it very clear that the philosopher is dependent on the polis and the division of labor in order to do his philosophizing. So mm -hmm. to be a complete stranger and to renounce the responsibilities of citizenship is to put oneself in a position where philosophizing is no longer an option. So I think that the thing that I deeply appreciate about Strauss is because he is not trying to be an idealist, he's actually working through the theoretical relationship between these trade-offs that exist, right? That thinking of the whole, which includes political philosophy, it includes the philosopher within the polis, is the necessity for recognizing that, you know, burning down your own house is a problem for the subject that is the philosopher to even engage in the act of philosophy to begin with. So there's this uh, moderation to me is this way of speaking about the zone of trade-offs and the tension between the order, let's say, of the state, the order of the theological of the religion and the order of the philosopher and that they are not reducible to one another in any way. And they have to be thought of within that context, which I guess then brings up the idea of the constitution or the way, the law of the land. What is the law of the land? And who at any given time is defining the way of life for the people within the polis? And there's tension, right, between the political and the, and the theological. You may have a an order defined by the state, where in order to practice your religion, you're actually violating the laws of the state, right? And so there's tension there. And for the philosopher, which is kind of the whole idea of philosopher as criminal, you know, for the philosopher to engage fully in his, in his actions, he must question the law of the land, you know, whether that be uh, the state and a political order or a theological order as well. And so that philosopher puts himself in the position of the stranger in the position of the criminal but he also must recognize that he is within the polis and the stability of the polis is his interest. So it's a, um, it's a position of ambiguity and of tension and it has both historical context, but there's also this higher kind of trans-historical purpose to the philosopher. He is outside of any particular law or any particular religion in terms of his acts of, of inquiry into the world. And yet he is both entangled in history and in the moment that he happens to be in. And Strauss is a way of drawing all of those tensions to the surface that doesn't allow your mind to collapse into these convenient solutions to what are per, like deep, deep, 
deep issues of philosophy. And I think on another hand, like we've kind of been ignoring these problems and it comes up in this uh, glorification of the, of the, you know, almost the philosopher provocateur who says whatever gets, you know, a row out of people and that that's some sort of act of bravery. When I think in some sense, um, there's, this, there's this paternal element to, to Strauss. You know, he's like a father rather than a man who's just, you know, come out of his, uh, you know, his, his father's house who wants to go and make something of himself in the world and, and shine his, his colors and, you know, impress people. But instead, you know, he's someone who has things and wants to protect them and wants to see the, the continuation of order so that there could be other philosophers. And so I really appreciate that about Strauss and it's something that I'm gonna stick with um, into the future because I don't see a lot of other people taking that position because it's unpopular. It's unpopular to take responsibility and to put virtue and moderation at the high point of your thought. And Strauss does so, and he puts us in the position of having to recognize that with, with seriousness and gravity because he does such a good job of making that argument. And those are my comments. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's very, very well argued. I'll have to ponder that for sure. Anyone want to follow up on that? Add to that? Debate that? I feel like the group is being a little shy. Is it just because this is for, for public? Uh, yeah, Jeff, please. Yeah, there's an aspect that's kind of emerged during this discussion of Strauss as sort of a cartographer. So kind of zooming out to like the age of exploration and nautical exploration with you know, Magellan and Captain Cook and whatnot. And it seems to me just um, in terms of the way that I've related to the course, I had not read Strauss before coming into the course, but now in a way I, I kind of have a sense, at least this might just be specific to the way that I'm relating to uh, the material, but um, him sort of mapping the field of human endeavor, particularly at the um, that convergence point between philosophy and politics. And in some ways, I think that the last, say, roughly 250 years, we've been living in an age of exploration, but in the context of the field of human endeavor, where we can do it at sufficient level of scale, in particular now with the, the nature of technology to bring things in terms of velocity online at a very rapid clip. And so I think that in terms of balancing sort of a dichotomy between, it's not strictly speaking a dichotomy, but these the, the question of wisdom and moderation, I think that at core of that is discernment with a view to orienting ourselves so that we can kind of keep the, the game going to you know borrow from uh, James P. Carr's The Infinite Game. Obviously there's considerations that come online when there's uh, zero sum players who are not uh, sort of interfacing on that basis. Um, but I think that he, as much as anyone I've read, and one of the ways that I, I've liked what's come online and the way that uh, Michael has um, crafted the course, uh, balancing the dichotomy between complexity of the material and then clarity in the presentation with a view to sort of, again, back to the, the nautical metaphor or the cartography metaphor to developing that compass or that sense of discernment, particularly, you know, whether it's at the level of the individual, but then all the way to the scale of, you know, the civilization. And obviously now our, our world it's the first global sort of civilization. Obviously there's different ways that that could be sliced and diced. But um, all of this is to say, I don't, I, you know, these are extemporaneous remarks and I don't have a, a kicker to, uh, to close with, but um, just by way of uh, wrapping up what I'm saying now, um, joining the chorus, this is an excellent program and um, it definitely is, uh, you know, rich food, and I can. I look forward to continuing to uh, learn from Strauss uh, in consultation with Michael. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for those comments, Jeff. And no, that's more than welcome. People should definitely, if the, if anyone wants to, just share some 
some closing thoughts of any kind that that's more than welcome. It's a great opportunity to do that. So it's very interesting to hear how you, how you think about that. And if anyone wants to reply to that or, or follow up on any of that or circle back to anything that came up previously. If I could just jump in for a minute. So one thing about philosophy and fathers, you know, Strauss was uh, well aware of and made a lot of the fact that in Plato's Republic, the conversation gets off the ground when Cephalus, the father of the family, leaves to go deal with his um, pious activities. That's when the philosophy gets off the ground is when the when the pious father has left the building. And so on one hand, he understands that philosophy is somehow very radical, in fact, when it comes to the, the paternal. And yet everybody, I think, is completely right who's focused on his sense of civic responsibility as a moral and philosophical obligation. Uh, you've seen already in some of the readings that you have the theoretically best teaching, for example, of the absolute rule of the wise. Well, it's tempered with the practical teaching of constitutionalism. Uh, Justin, it is a theme that came up in some of the uh, some of the writings, and Strauss does defend the idea of the legislators who found a second best alternative to the absolute rule of the wise, namely a good law code that the people can accept when they're willing to accept the wisdom of the wise. So the a, a written or constituted legal order in an act of legislation is a sort of act is like the highest act of political philosophy legislation. We should always think, I think about why the philosopher should be concerned with legislation, with law. Raven brought out a lot of good points in in that connection um but definitely about the civic responsibility definitely about the fathers and um and this idea if you remember from what is political philosophy that in the conversation about drinking wine so if anybody knows this essay what is political philosophy discusses plato's laws in the early part of plato's laws there's a conversation about uh drinking wine and what strauss says is that this they it's like a vicarious act of drunkenness for all of the participants and what it does is it drags the old non-philosophical men closer to philosophy and it drags the sort of pure philosopher closer to the act of legislation. And that's where they find their happy medium. Somehow wine moderates the wisdom of the philosopher and elevates the unphilosophical law abidingness of the old men of the city. So one other last thing I want to add that came up just in my mind as I was hearing everybody talk is that Strauss um, actually two other things. I'll be brief about it. The first is that you have to understand, I think, that he has a sort of political phenomenology. We have to be sensitive to the actual political phenomena. We can't just impose a theoret an abstract theoretical net over them. And if we're attentive to the phenomena of political life, then we discover the gap between the wise and the vulgar and all of these other things that lead him into these, um, into these compromises or into these tensions that we've discussed. So very attentive to the political phenomena, and you need a return to classical political philosophy, he thought, in order to see the phenomena clearly, because as we've discussed, in modern political thought, all you have is the conceptual abstractions laid over top of the basic experiences of political life. And one other thing about the importance of moderation, just to reemphasize it for those of you here and for those of you listening, this focus on moderation as a virtue of the philosopher's speech gives us access to the history of political philosophy. Because if we don't focus on moderation, we may misread the texts that we've inherited. We may misunderstand the lip service paid to conventional pieties for the genuine teaching of the thinker. So moderation also gives us that hermeneutic access to the tradition. All right, I like the, I like the contrarian take that wine can make people more uh, moderate or, or balanced or calibrated. It's not what you would generally think of when you think of wine. When I drink too much wine, I feel like I become a more provocative and uh, immodest philosopher. If I can just interject, because it's crazy. It's a serendipitous thing. I, I was just reading Kant's Anthropology, very like obscure text. We, of course, read Kant, um, Jacob Pierre Reason, his Anthropology is not very, but he talks about the virtue of drunkenness for precisely this reason. He says that it's important to drink moderately, of course, but that's in Prussia. So who knows how moderate they were, but because it, it allows for frankness of discussion, which is an important part of living in, uh, living in society is to 
uh, be able to speak in a more frank and honest manner on certain occasions. So Kant actually says it's it's crucial for to be wholly virtuous that you drink on at the right occasion. So another example. <laughs> That is interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. I feel like the moderation effects of drinking wine come in the day after when you kind of regret it and you're like, okay, now nah, we need more law and order. <laughs> but anybody who hasn't, you have to read the first few books of Plato's laws. The discussion when it gets to this defense of the institution of wine drinking is really amazing. And uh, I don't want to spoil it for you. I just want to encourage you to look at it. That is fascinating. I think we might have to do a whole st standalone workshop on, on the role of wine drinking in philosophy. That, that would actually be really interesting. Excellent. I want to, if I may, return to something that Stephen said in his talk, and and I'm giving you all, you know, time to, uh, if if anyone wants to circle back to anything. Now, this is your final chance, folks. So I, I do kind of encourage you all to to think a little bit about some sort of final words you might want to say in, in whatever in whatever direction or what, however that looks for you. It'd be nice to hear from everyone, possibly. But I was interested in uh, Stephen's talk about this this kind of a different way of possibly returning to Plato, and I wanted to basically just ask him to speak a little bit more to something. I was just uh, I was struck in particular by what Stephen you were saying about this idea that perhaps perhaps Nietzsche is misunderstood as a as a as a critic of Christianity, and that in some way perhaps Nietzsche is guilty of reading Plato too much through Christianity, and in, in some ways perhaps you seem to be suggesting that Nietzsche is uh, perhaps more Christian than, than he wanted to admit. Uh, so I was kind of just curious about that. I was, I was just curious if you wanted to speak to that a little bit more. I found that quite a tantalizing idea. And then um, a little bit more generally, um, I, I'm curious about the, the larger gist of your talk, because it almost, in, in your abstract, you talk about a, a, a different type of of Platonism, perhaps that Strauss might point the way to in which this alternative Platonism would, as you say, build upon the modern sciences, not with a vision of downward reduction to materialism, but of upward extension to, to human cognitive, social and ethical life. So that to me, it kind of sounds like a, a kind of like a transhumanist kind of uh, vision or a transhumanist kind of trajectory. And that's very unexpected. That's very, that's, that's quite an intriguing um, idea to emerge from a Strauss seminar. So uh, I just wanted to check, am, am I right in detecting that, that kind of, that, that kind of transhumanist vibe, or am I wrong on that? And if so, uh, maybe you could speak to what that would look like a little bit more. I'm quite curious. Hmm. So I think the point I was making about Nietzsche and also Heidegger in his own way, um, is that they are in certain ways reactive. They are responding to things in the history of philosophy, but also in their own personal environments. And, the, and there's personal history involved that doesn't necessarily clearly come out in the writing. Um, so, you know, and, and these, these are not obscure facts, but they're often not like, um, thematized or not really sort of made a center of, of investigation. I mean, Nietzsche's father was a Lutheran minister. He came from a very pious um, family. His father died when he was young, but his, um, his mother and aunts were all like very pious Lutherans. Um, Heidegger was not just Catholic growing up, but actually a seminarian. He actually entered seminary um, uh, uh, intended to become a Jesuit. He was a Jesuit novice at one point, then went to um, um, uh, 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 theological studies um, with an eye to becoming a priest before abandoning that course. Um, did, his, did a lot of academic work in theology, wrote, wrote a uh, habilitation thesis, not his doctorate, but the thesis after the doctorate on Dun Scotus, who's a you know, late medieval, scholastic theologian and philosopher. So he, he has this um, very strong background. And so the question I was raising or pointing to is to what extent is their um, interpretation of the history of philosophy colored by that in a way that one might want to further examine or even critique or even propose alternatives to. And in particular, the relationship with Plato, I, I think is really interesting and, and important. Um, so Nietzsche called 
Christianity Platonism for the masses. Um, but, but I'm wondering if there's actually a little bit of the reverse going on where he's reading Plato as in, implicitly a precursor to Christianity and that itself is coloring his reading of Plato um, because he, he like has a sense of this is where things are heading and I don't like that. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that, that sort of um, blocks certain, a certain access to Plato because there's a kind of prejudice in the reading of it. And I'm, what, what I'm was sort of pointing to or gesturing towards is, um, is there a fruitful way of reading Plato that doesn't do that, that doesn't, that, that tries to be conscious more conscious of, of that um, context and less reactive. So there's not a assumption of, of, of a, a kind of atheistic basis. So it, it's very interesting in Nietzsche. People like c consider Nietzsche clearly an atheistic philosopher and, and talk about him in that context. But one interesting thing that you don't find in Nietzsche is arguments for atheism. He doesn't really like give you any argument for like why atheism must be true or, or why a religious option cannot be true. He rather simply presupposes it. He, he, he sort of presupposes um, that there are certain options that are dead and that need to be recognized as dead. And, and then he's like very subtle in his exploration of the consequences of them being dead. Um, and uh, in, in some way is it warns about the potentially very grave negative consequences. So he, you know, the whole God is dead thing is not advocacy, is warning. But, but nonetheless, it's, there's a presumption that God is in fact dead and that this does not need to be argued for. Um, this does not need to be, you know, e explored as an underlying fact, what needs to be explored is the consequences of the fact. And um, so what I'm pointing to in, in Plato is, is, is there a way of reading Plato that tries to remove that prejudice and um, look again at Plato, even in a, in a metaphysical way, which Strauss is very, very cherry of, um, and kind of, I know, there are quotes from Strauss saying that he, he could never make heads or tails of the, of the theory of forms. Um, and my take on that is, yeah, I bet you didn't try very hard <laughs> because you're a really smart guy and you probably could have made heads or tails of it if you had wanted to. Um, and there's a kind of not wanting to go there. I think in Strauss and um, I mean, certainly other very smart people have, have, have thought they could make heads or tails of it, whether or not they agreed with it. Um, and so the whole point about the sciences is I think there are ways of reading modern science and the development of modern science that would actually be quite platonic in this fuller sense, and um, that that don't presuppose a kind of materialism that I think flows out of early modernity and the the, the key early modern philosophers, and that and that without it all sort of disturbing the ability to effectively do science could lead in very different directions philosophically in terms of how we interpret that science. Um, with regard to transhumanism, I, I wasn't really thinking of transhumanism in the sense of the singularity or, or uploading or um, cyborg merging or, or anything like that. Um, but I do think there's a kind of um, transhumanism that involves a kind of reflection on 
humanity's place in the cosmos where humanity is viewed as precisely because we do have reason and reflection and um, uh, can sort of grasp and internalize the order of the universe um, and then build upon that, that, that I, I don't know if transhumanism is quite the right word, but, but I do think that there's a certain kind of destiny there um, that would be very consonant with the direction of science that I was gesturing towards. Okay, fascinating, fascinating. I, Michael, you know, I, I, I hope that my uh, questions as an outsider are maybe uh, interesting and, uh, you know, challenging or, or fun for everyone to entertain. But, uh, you know, Michael, since you have much more familiarity with what the group has been most interested in over the past several weeks, you should definitely feel free also to, uh, to steer the conversation in, uh, in any way that you think uh, people might find more, you know, rewarding if, if there is such a different path, but, um, I'd love to hear from anyone else on anything really. I do just want to say something about this point on uh, Heidegger, Nietzsche, and Plato that I think is that I think is um, important. So, first of all, if it's accurate that Nietzsche and Heidegger have a uh, a reading of Plato that is a reading of Christian Platonism, then Strauss's accomplishment in bringing to light an alternative to Christian Platonism through his particular uh, way of reading, his interpretations, and his uh, labors would be hugely important for us. If somehow our access to Plato is mediated by in a tradition that's not quite on the mark or on the money. So I want to read you something that Strauss says. City and Man, page 61. We have access to Plato primarily only through the Platonic tradition, for it is that tradition to which we owe the interpretations, translations, and editions. The Platonic tradition has been for many centuries a tradition of Christian Platonism. The blessings which we owe to that tradition must not blind us, however, to the fact that there is a difference between Christian and primitive Platonism. In other words, somehow genuine, proper, non-Christian, uh, non-historicist Platonism. And if that's the case, then again, Strauss has done us the great favor of recovering what a primitive Platonism might be not only through his works on Plato, but also through his works on Xenophon and Aristophanes, uh, the two other major sources of our knowledge of uh, Socrates. Um, I want to add something else to that, which is independent of the Christian angle to the question. If you compare Heidegger's reading of the cave allegory, which you can find in, I think it's called On the Essence of Truth, if you compare Heidegger's reading of the cave allegory, you'll see that he treats it in isolation from the rest of the Republic. In other words, he thinks that he can just focus on the meaning of aletheia, on the meaning of truth and being in that part of the conversation and use it to understand the subsequent history of being. If you compare that to Strauss's treatment of the Republic, for example, by reading the first few pages of what he writes about the Republic in the Plato chapter of City and Man, you'll see that Strauss begins with the whole universe of Plato's writings, beginning from a comparative study of their titles. Because since Plato is not a character in his own dialogues, we don't necessarily know which of the, which of the views is Plato's. He, if Socrates said it, doesn't mean Plato thought it. But Strauss says Plato had control over the titles. So if you compare how different Strauss is in trying to give us an understanding to the whole cosmos of Plato's thought on one hand, to how Heidegger is and just zeroing in on the passages that are relevant for telling the story of the history of being, you get another stark alternative and contrast to Heidegger's Plato. And uh, you know Nietzsche called Socrates the vortex of world history. Heidegger called Socrates the purest thinker of the West. And Strauss um, put his stakes on the problem of Socrates as the best solution we have to the problem of natural rights. So for all of them, Socrates and Plato stand at the center of things. And therefore, I think we should be grateful for Strauss's uh, excavation of primitive Platonism. Excellent. That's absolutely fascinating. Anyone want to chime in on that or raise a different question? Maybe something they heard before or want to just share some, some closing thoughts of your own? 
I'm not neglecting hands up, right? I don't, I don't see any. No, Let's- no. Don't be shy. I, listen, I had the pleasure of sitting in on everybody's breakout rooms over the last eight weeks. So I, I know, know that we, you're yeah. talkative and opinionated, which is great. Um, yeah. And you have an opportunity here to take advantage of, uh, of our final time together. We might, if we want to talk a little bit about, I was interested in uh, Sam's comments on Strauss and Spinoza and these larger questions around the role of religion in society today. Uh, and this, especially this question of, you know, the, the role of religion or revelation should or should not, or will or will not play in an increasingly secular society. I think there's a lot there if, if people are interested uh, in, you know, picking apart any angle on that. Did, did Strauss help you see anything on this front that's maybe worth sharing? I or mean, Sam, maybe, maybe yeah. you could speak to it a little bit more if you'd like to. Um, but specifically, maybe just to be specific, um, you know, there are, there are, there is in a weird way, a lot of interest right now in religion. There, there seems to be a, a, a strange kind of revival going on or a kind of pseudo revival. There's, there's a, a flourishing right now of, of secular religions in a way, um, you know, what's all, what's sometimes called new age thought, or uh, you can call it by many different names, but there is a, a real flowering right now of interest in, you know, non-materialistic, non-scientific uh, frameworks for thinking about the world, whether that's, you know, a return to trad Catholicism or it's uh, a renewed interest in astrology or whatever the case might be. Um, th- there's definitely something going on there's also, you know, a, a new wave of Instagram preachers and uh, very, very inter- and, and very interesting phenomena on this front. So, you know, as we think about the role that re- that that religion or revelation plays in society today, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, w- just w- what in your view, Sam, if you could boil it down or anyone else also, I'd love to hear from everyone, you know, um, what, what what did Strauss's teachings on on religion or revelation you know, uh, give you that, uh, in terms of some kind of lens on, on this, the role or situation of religion in, in our increasingly secular Western societies. So I don't buy the Strauss's argument about religion and revelation necessarily having to be separate. I feel he appeals too much to this kind of very crude liberal uh, secular sentiment in order to justify the separation of religion and philosophy. I mean, he's, basically what he's saying is if you, you hey, liberals, you buy this kind of uh, premise, the state and religion must be separate. So why shouldn't religion and philosophy have to be separate as well? Isn't doesn't uh, religion and imp- by combining religion and philosophy, doesn't that impede on the philosopher's freedom? And my argument would be much closer to Spinoza in this instance, where uh, when Spinoza has this very stoic attitude where you have to, where you discover what's within nature. And once you discover that, you kind of have the duty to act upon it and uh, further your. Uh, Conatus, as he would put it, uh, into uh, and, uh, and the kind of your actions have to line up to what you actually see. Okay. I would say having, and I, I would say that attitude where you have to align both your your actions with your understanding of the world, rather than your actions with a more antiquated understanding of the world, which is what traditional religion is. Uh, is this is what is necessary right now all right i appreciate the 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 challenge there if anyone wants to take that up or reply to that or yeah walter sure uh sam could you go on a little more about what in what way you're preserved are you talking about preserving religion or eradicating religion in this way um is there is there still a place for revelation or or um one of the revealed religions i'm not sure how you're thinking about that um, I, th- I mean, I didn't say anything about that in the comments, but I could talk about that. I don't, I don't, I don't 
some skeptical of accepting revelation in today's world. While it might while it might be beneficial to some people in order to bring order to their lives, I don't think there's a uh, broader social uh, good that revelation brings beyond giving uh, individuals some sense of uh, stability, cleaning up your room in uh, Jordan Peterson parlance. But uh, I, I, but I think that uh, religion or traditions serve an important value and shouldn't be ruthlessly critiqued. I think we should go back and discover what these traditions mean in their original context and then see if we could, how that can translate into, uh, into uh, today's world. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, aspects of religion do we need to bring back in today's world? Like a friend and I were just talking the other night about uh, the, ne the necessity of sacrifice and how uh, if you really, if you really want to make an impact on the world, maybe going to a protest or going to vote or just expressing yourself as, uh, is popular today. That's not the best way to go about things. Maybe you do have to sacrifice yourself for something greater. Take, a like for an example, an example, uh, it's like people are, I've gotten in during the past few months due to coronavirus, people have gotten really impassioned by factory farms and the environmental and uh, health impact they have. Now, uh, I'm gonna, I'd be hypocritical to say that I would do this myself since I'm quite a carnivore, but if you, uh, like, there are people I've seen on Twitter who sack, who aren't, don't buy from, uh, factory farms and they're trying to incorporate uh, non-meat alternatives or buying okay. or spending more money towards uh, buying uh, organic beef. Okay. So Walter, did you want to maybe take a stab at the, the larger, the larger question at stake here or anyone else want to want to want to talk on any, any of these themes? Because I just want to mention one thing in connection to this question. Yeah. Uh, so if you remember, I think it was our first reading where Strauss was looking at the living issues of post-war German philosophy. And he traced so many uh, movements of thought to the crisis of modern rationalism. If reason is unable to provide meaningful guidance for a human life, and people can't live without meaningful guidance for their lives, they turn to other traditions, they turn to other sources of meaning, other um, symbols where they can gain some sense of what they're doing and why they're doing it. In Alexander Dugan's thought, he has a section in fourth political theory called the return of myth and archaics, where he says, let's go to all of the, all of the resources that were pushed aside at the start of secular modernity and, and a sort of a metaphysics of debris, take everything that was pushed away and uh, thrown away and put it back at the center of our attention as sources of meaning. But Strauss would say, just because there's been a crisis of modern rationalism, doesn't mean that we have to abandon all rationalism. It only means that we have to try to recover a sense of what the pre-modern rationalism was that may have been sufficient in itself to give us guidance, meaning, symbolism, uh, and everything that we look for when we turn today, as Justin said, to um, all kinds of neo uh, neo spiritual pagan and uh, new age type alter alternatives. Um, there may be a rational alternative that isn't devoid of, uh, of meaning or even of depth and excitement. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. What about the rest of you who've been relatively quiet? I know you've all been talking a lot over the past eight weeks. I, I would really be genuinely just very curious to learn any any final thoughts that any of you have, uh, especially those of you who maybe have been relatively quiet? You could just say a, a brief w few words, I'm sure, about just personally what what has stuck with you the most, what 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 ideas or insights that have uh, been generated over the course of the past eight weeks 
just what, you know, as you, as you look back on the past eight weeks, I'm just kind of curious what, what ideas or thoughts have stuck with you the most, if anyone wants to step up, but no pressure. If you just don't want to, it's perfectly fine. I'm just encouraging. I'll just, okay. I'll just yeah. respond to the Please. kind of the question of, of religion and philosophy yeah. and whether or not there's a tension between the two. Mm-hmm. I definitely can see the argument for there being a tension uh, or almost a kind of absurdity, especially in the case of, uh, of a revival of religion. If we take the exoteric teachings of any religious doctrine, particularly the Abrahamic religions, to be the uh, the, the truth of a way of life, then we're put into a position of mosaic law you know, being the, the right way to, to deal with justice. Um, we have, you know, obviously different uh, notions of the roles of men and women in, in, this, uh, in these texts. Um, there's certain kinds of understandings around piety and morality and, and sex. And uh, in some sense, I feel like the revival of religion puts people who are living the way that we're living now in a position of having to cherry pick which then gives you, gives the question of like, well, how do we do it such a thing, right? So then that puts us into a bigger question of like, what's the framework of which we're approaching a uh, religion and how do we decide what are the things that we want to draw out of this tradition and what are the things that we want to leave behind? And I think that you could say that philosophy is a way in which you could actually engage in the meta question, although there is also potentially a theological aspect of, of doing that practice as well. But in doing, in doing that turn, I think it brings up a bunch of other questions that philosophy, at least for me, um, helps me to engage in much more deeply. And I think that maybe this is how I can uh, relate to some of the things about Strauss that I will be continuing to ponder in, in, in the future, is this question of thinking about the whole, uh, the striving for the thought of the whole, and beginning there in terms of whether what what kind of world do we want to emerge into uh, and how do we want to think of that world from a philosophical perspective and challenging ourselves to try and include all of these different things that are actually in tension with one another, right? Like the exoteric teachings of a religion um, that may even be used in a political manner in order to create a sense of justice and order in society. Like if you are within that type of world, you're put into a position as a philosopher to question those teachings and where they come from. And if they come from divine revelation as the authority, then you're placed into the position of questioning divine revelation. And can you really call yourself a Christian if you don't accept that as, a, as an authority of truth, right? So I think that um, by thinking of the whole and by allowing all of these tensions to come to the surface as Strauss does, we can actually Oh, I mean, it's so intense for your mind. You know, you can't collapse into one position or the other. You can't make a convenient kind of glossy, smooth cover for for these inherent like contradictions that seem to be existing in in all of these different positions that you can take within the within the life of the whole. Um, and I guess for me, this is just like a very superficial under like my understanding of Strauss is super superficial. And I will continue to be coming back to his work because the depth, I think, is where we can really begin to uh, bring his way of thinking to the positions that we find ourselves in, in our contemporary moment, because there's so many contradictions in the things that we're seeing in the world around us. There's so many different things that uh, judgments and superficial ideas and political ideology and these uh, attachments that people have to the way in which they want to live that we have to question. And yet we also don't want to totally cause uh, disruption and upheaval in in the world that we live in. And well, what if people have have an attachment to creating disruption and upheaval? What position does that put us in, right? So there's all of these things about the contemporary moment that the way in which Strauss thinks, which is a much deeper kind of position than any particular thing that he says, I think is a very, um, important set of kind of contours and approaches to our moment as it stands. And I would say I'm, I'm very early to my, this is my first time reading Strauss in, in any way. Um, and it's been very helpful to have um, Millerman as a guide through his work. And I really look forward to continuing these conversations around Strauss. And it's been an excellent 
excellent course. And hopefully we'll have Millerman back again uh, to, to illuminate with other types of subjects as well. I love to hear it. Thanks, Raven. Very interesting thoughts there. And th thank you for, for sharing from your personal perspective. And uh, yeah, Michael and I are, are definitely talking and planning about what's next, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just very pleased that the course seems to, by all indications, was a great success. And it's very, it's very fun for me to listen to you all share your final thoughts uh, in, in today's session. Because like I said, this is the first time that I uh, wasn't actively participating in the seminars and just kind of helping, helping to run behind the scenes. But so it's, 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 it's really quite rewarding uh, for me and I'm, I'm sure for Michael as well to hear you all kind of share your final thoughts today. It's, it's, it's very, very impressive and uh, very rewarding. So thank you all for, for bringing your A-game over the past eight weeks and, and today for showing up and uh, sharing some of your, your personal final thoughts. So we still do have a little bit of time. Uh, so if anyone wants to, you know, um, share any final thoughts, you're still more than welcome to, but we are coming up on the, the two hour mark. So I, I should try to start um, uh, you know, wrapping this up or at least moving in that direction. So there are just a couple things I'd like to say, and then it, the, the, there'll be some time to, um, you know, if anyone wants to share some other thoughts. And of course, I, I, I would certainly uh, love to invite Michael to share any closing thoughts he has, especially if Michael has any, you know, any thoughts around maybe advice for the future. You know, Michael, if you want to leave everyone with a, a few parting words on, you know, how you see, how you see the philosophical life uh, from a longer term perspective, any, any, any ideas or, or thoughts or advice you might want to leave people with as you, you know, push them off into the world um, at, 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 at the end of this, this eight week group experience. Uh, so one thing I want to just remind everyone is that the way we're trying to run these courses, at least for them, at least as it stands, the, the current game plan and, and vision for it all is that, um, you know, as a, as a participant in this course, you're, you're in, you're in for good. This is going to be hopefully an indefinitely running thing where um, we'll be maintaining the course community. And if there are future cohorts of this course, which, which uh, we hope there will be, and, and, and that's at least tentatively the plan uh, to do more rounds of this course and the other courses to make each of the courses that we're running their own little you know, mini institution as it were. And every time we open it, more people come in and we grow out the community of, of, of Strauss scholars and, 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 and thinkers and creators who are interested in the themes of the course. Uh, the goal or the plan or the hope would be that this community, which you're the, the the beginning founding members of in a way, will continue to grow and will continue to stay active and, and thriving over a longer period of time. And so you're in the group, you're you're in for good as far as I'm concerned, that, that's the game plan. And so when there are future cohorts, when we do another eight week seminar, um, there'll be a new a new batch of people coming in to interested in Strauss or and the same goes for the other courses that we're doing. So I just want to remind you all that, you know, this is a longer term thing, hopefully. We, we, we hope that this is not just a, an eight week jaunt for you all, but just the beginning of something, uh, hopefully longer term, hopefully that will continue to, to be rewarding and enriching for all of you. And we hope to, to be building this community and sustaining it and maintaining it over time. So I just want to remind you of that. Please do stay active in, in the community, the course community at the very least. And when we do other cohorts, you know, stay tuned for that and keep your eyes peeled for that because we would love to have you, um, continue to participate in one way or another. So just wanted to make sure that's clear to everyone. So, so, you know, we're not just at the end of this, uh, final eighth session. We're not just, uh, all going separate ways. Uh, although you'll carry on and do different things, so please do stay in touch is all I'm saying really in the forum and, and stay tuned for watching this space develop. Michael, I wonder if, uh, you'd like to uh, give any parting words. And then, uh, if anyone wants to share some parting words, you can maybe, if you wouldn't mind putting your, your digital hand up so I could keep track of it. If you go down to reactions, you can put a hand up and uh, anyone who wants to say anything and, and before we wrap it up is more than welcome to. Um, but I'm sure Michael wants to say at least a few things before we wrap up this eighth and final session. Yeah. Do you mind if I just throw it over to Sasha first? I saw you had his hand up for, for a while. Oh, absolutely. I just, I didn't notice that. Please go ahead, Sasha. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, I guess say, say a couple of things. I wanted to offer my own unsolicited feedback that this course has just been excellent. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed the Strauss. But uh, yeah, having Michael Millerman as a guide is incredible. You're just an excellent, enthusiastic, extremely clear, wonderful teacher. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then in, in terms of Strauss, I, I, I'm not sure I've fully digested and sort of interconnected all the ideas we've discussed. And I, I really look forward to, to trying to dig into, you know, working through one and probably more coherent works of his. 
Uh, but one of the things that really struck me, and I've, I've already talked about this in the course, but it was, uh, I, I did the wrong reading one day by mistake um, and ended up reading instead of um, a, a dialogue between uh, Strauss and another philosopher on, on Xenophon, uh, not, not a dialogue, a, a correspondence. Strauss's, uh, the, the original text uh, on, on Hiro and then Strauss's reading of it and was floored by his reading um, in, in a couple ways. One, one was that it sort of revealed my own uh, historicist mindset, you might put it, and that I was approaching it uh, in, in a way that I'd become accustomed to in, in my previous you know, life as a, as a student, as, a, as an English major, where you read through something to sort of like get the gist of it so you can sort of talk about it and sort of engage with it, but you're not treating it particularly seriously as a thing that has, you know, uh, that is modern in its intellectual impact and uh, has real depths and complexities and has something to offer you. And to, to dig into his reading of it, which was the precise opposite of that, it was to take it deadly seriously, to look at all the layers that determine the way it was written and why it was written as such, and uh, see what that teaches us, not just about, this, about the surface level of the text, but about what the author is trying to accomplish, why he's choosing certain things, what the political situation must be that appears to necessitate these series of choices, um, and what the implications of all that were. It was uh, really pretty stunning for me. I don't think I've, I've seen a close reading that was that uh, incredible, um, that perceptive, um, serious, well-intentioned, et cetera. Um, and, and in addition to all the individual ideas that came out of this course that I'm still working mm -hmm. to connect, I, I found that really rewarding and fascinating and, and uh, made me want to dig in more. So yeah, don't want to take up more time, but oh, also guys, I've really enjoyed taking this course with you. Uh, it's, it's a great group of people. It's been super fun. Stay in touch. Thank you so much for that, Sasha. Thank you for those parting words. Very interesting. And, and also, very kind. I'm just glad. I'm so glad to hear everyone's had such a positive experience. And a uh, quick plug for Raven's uh, clubhouse chats that she's doing around Strauss and, and other things. So that's a really great thing to see. I definitely applaud this and support this. And if there's anything I can do to help sustain that or keep that going or or whatever, please do let me know. But uh, we definitely strongly encourage, yes, yeah, spontaneously self-organized discussion groups, reading groups, whatever you folks want to do moving forward. Definitely, you know, this is a valuable, it's, it's, it's one of the, one of the, the, the greatest benefits, I think, of these courses that we do is that now you have this little community of people who are very interested in this kind of stuff. So definitely feel free to uh, keep that going. And uh, I hope you all continue to stay in touch with each other and, you know, uh, keep posting to the forum, keep uh, meeting in clubhouse chats or, or uh, you know, talking amongst yourselves and supporting each other in your, your future investigations. Anyone else want to throw a hand up? Maybe Michael wants to have the final word as the uh, as the conductor of this course. He's he's been in charge the, the whole time, so uh, he should properly. It, it, uh, propriety dictates that Michael has uh, the the true final word. So please, Michael, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. So first, I want to thank you, Justin, for the invitation to teach um, with other life and with indie thinkers. It's been a great privilege for me. There's nothing I would rather do than discuss Strauss with people who are interested in it and these big problems of politics and philosophy. So it's just been the highlight of my week every week. Thanks for the invitation. I want to thank everybody who's here now and who's in the course, people who you know maybe weren't in the seminars, but just bought access to the videos and watched them. Uh, everybody who's been meeting week after week in the seminars, I've learned a lot from listening to you discuss about what you find is most relevant in Strauss, what really resonates with your contemporary concerns and with what you are looking to as really important for us. So I've gained a lot out of just being with you and, and listening to uh, listening to you, even more so today uh, because of your great presentations. So I wanna thank all of you for um, for that. And if, uh, if you haven't read any Strauss, if you're listening on YouTube, I strongly recommend that you take some time and read what is political philosophy? What is liberal education? Anything you can get your hands on as a start. You've heard the people share about how Strauss is a great, uh, a great teacher, a great reader, a great interpreter of texts. Those of you who are in the class, I encourage you to just continue reading. Um, not, just, not just Strauss. He had many interlocutors who were very serious thinkers, and he's opened up a whole world of, um, of places to turn to next, uh, whether it's his readings of old philosophers or whether you really want to take your best shot at Strauss from the 
perspective of Spinoza or Heidegger or somebody else, there's just hopefully many more roads open to you now intellectually than there were uh, when you started uh, when you started the course. So these are questions that concern us, uh, how to live well individually, how to live well together, what is justice, what is the good life, what can we know? And I hope, and I think on the basis of what you shared today that this has been successful, uh, in showing that Strauss is a really great guide to all of that for us. And I just want to tell you, for those of you who have said something about my teaching, first of all, thank you. Okay, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. And for me, Strauss is the gold standard teacher. Everything that I've been able to con convey to you that's valuable is me just trying to mimic and emulate and share what I've learned from him. Um, so all credit where it belongs, all credit where it's due. That's really it. Just immense gratitude, uh, Justin, to you and to all of the participants. All right. Excellent. Excellent. I think that pretty much is a wrap, everyone. I think what we'll